So the forum has been going now for about three decades and we've hosted some excellent speakers over the years who have really been on the cutting edge of science and faith, faith and uh, humanities, faith and social sciences. And um, it's been wonderful. It's been encouraging to graduate students and also faculty here at the University of British Columbia. So it's, it's also wonderful to be able to feature scholarship, yeah, to, to let people know what kind of scholarship is available in these various fields on faith and theology, theology and, and academic issues. And so we're thankful for some support from the Murren Fund and uh, we'll look forward to our lecture today with Paul Allen. And here is Olaf Slaymaker to introduce him, Olaf. Thank you, Gordon. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce you, Paul. And first of all, I have the uh, pleasure to begin by acknowledging that the land on which some of us are gathering virtu virtually is the still un unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. It's a very general recognition of the large variety of First Nations lands on which uh, many of us sit. But I notice that we have a, a visitor from India today, this may not mean very much to him. But I can assure you it's not just a formula, it is a recognition of a, a very important issue in, in our province in terms of the seriousness with which we take the fact that the lands of British Columbia, uniquely in the whole of Canada, have not been officially ceded. So there's a huge challenge that uh, we have to face in coming to grips with that uh, long-term problem. So this uh, forum, as Gord has said, is a forum that is hosted at by UBC and which exists to foster exchange on the relationship between faith and scholarship. We're particularly privileged to have Paul Allen uh, with us as our speaker. Uh, he is the Dean and Professor of Theology at Corpus Christi College, which is located on the UPC cal uh, campus. Paul has come to us from Concordia University in Montreal within the past two years. And since his arrival has been overwhelmed by the administrative responsibilities that are associated with being the Dean of such an important faculty. He's kindly agreed to talk to us, not about administration, <laughs> but about critical realism and enduring epistemology for science and theology. Some of his recent writings uh, are listed on the advertised abstract and many of us in our various fields have uh, considerable interest, some of us professionally and some of us because of our faith concerns about explaining to scientists and colleagues what is the relationship between faith and scholarship. So we really look forward to hearing from you, Paul, and also we look forward to the question session after the completion of your presentation. Please accept our sincere thanks for your willingness to do this for us. Dr. Paul Allen. Thank you very much, Olaf. Uh, that was a, a very kind uh, introduction and I greatly appreciate it. I am uh, honored to be here uh, today to, uh, to speak with you and I'm thankful to the forum and to Gordon in particular uh, for extending the invitation. Um, and I'm looking forward uh, over the coming months and uh, hopefully years in, in, um, to, to be uh, continue an involvement with the forum and to get to know others on the UBC campus uh, personally. So uh, first of all, before I share my slides, I'm just wondering uh, if I could just get a, a rough show of hands to indicate that my voice is coming through sufficiently clearly. Okay, yeah. thank you. I'm seeing hands um, and hopefully that's uh, a consensus. So now I'm gonna share my uh, screen and, uh, and then we can <clears throat> proceed. 
I'm trusting that uh, all of you can now see my screen in addition to hearing my voice, which are the two things that I think we need to, uh, to continue. Right. So um, my, my talk uh, today is uh, titled Critical Realism and Enduring Epistemology for Science and Theology. Uh, a little bit about the word enduring. Um, and for those of you who had a glance at my uh, draft of a paper, which I had worked on previously and uh, still need to go, go back to, uh, my concern here is to uh, talk about how we view knowledge, uh, both in the natural sciences and theology, in order to secure the bridge between the two that I believe exists. But the bridge between theology and science is not a simple uh, footbridge. It's more like Lion's Gate. It's a bit of a, it's a, it's a bit of a gigantic kind of structure that has to be built uh, very carefully. Um, with attention to all kinds of detail, engineering, um, aesthetic, or otherwise. So one of the, uh, over the, I suppose, or last 20 years now, um, what had previously been a virtual consensus, at least amongst uh, a set of scientist theologians, uh, came in for some criticism. And so what I mean by that is beginning in the 1980s and 90s in particular, figures such as Ian Barber, John Polkinghorne, Arthur Peacock, uh, and several others, Alistair McGrath a bit later, um, adopted in various ways with various degrees of um, um, intensity uh, or seriousness, uh, adopted what they refer to as critical, uh, uh, an epistemology, a theory of knowledge that is known as critical realism on the understanding or the premise that it's a way of thinking of knowledge that is equally applicable, applicable both to the natural sciences on the one hand and to theology, at least Christian theology on the other hand. So beginning in, I would say, the late 90s already, and then into the 2000s, a number of mostly philosophers uh, of science, actually, um, leveled critiques against critical realism, and in particular, critiques against the scientist theologians who had advocated for critical realism. Um, and while these various critiques come from somewhat different perspectives, um, I think the overall charge was that critical realism is too simple. Uh, some believe that it's not uh, uh, historically informed. Others believe that critical realism is still too indebted to meta metaphysics. There's a number of variations of this criticism. Um, so what I'm going to do today is outline um, a little bit of that history, but more specifically, I want to um, put, put, some, put some notes or put some uh, indicators down in which uh, I, I want to show that critical realism, I think, can still be seen as an interdisciplinary theory of knowledge, an interdisciplinary way of um, thinking about how we know, how we know anything, whether it's a knowledge in the sciences or knowledge uh, in theology. So that's that's my task. Um, I have about 20 slides or so, and I'm going to put it into, um, there, I've put it into the uh, projection mode. So I'm going to proceed. Um, because I can only see some of you on, on a sidebar uh, of this presentation, uh, perhaps I can, if there's a, a question of clarification, uh, or if my voice did not come through clearly enough, uh, perhaps you can put something up on the chat bar. And um, hopefully I will be able to notice it and, uh, and, and then just, uh, and then just go back if needs, if needs be. Okay. Uh, 
So some philosophical basics about what uh, critical realism suggests or implies. Uh, a lot of the philosophy or the philosophical energy behind critical realism in fact has to do with the landmark philosophy of Immanuel Kant um, associated with uh, German transcendental idealism. Um, and one way in which this has been described uh, uh, and Kant of course is the preeminent early modern philosopher, but one way in which Kant's philosophy can be described uh, and which figures into um, current usage of the term critical realism is from that first uh, descriptive quote there, namely that somehow a philosopher or a thinker might say, the thing itself exists, but is not perceptible. So somehow there's this uh, understanding that the thing in itself, um, the Kantian philosophers or Kant and other philosophers used uh, sort of the technical term of the noumena um, to say that the noumena exists, but we can only know the phenomena. We only know the appearances or expressions um, through which the thing exists for us or to us. And we um, subjects or knowers uh, require concepts and it's these conceptual frameworks that we use to know something. But when we know something, we don't know the thing in itself. Um, so that's that's a very important um, legacy of Kant's philosophy. And I won't go into all the details of that, but it, it is to say that it has had a tremendous impact on modern philosophy, uh, including modern philosophy of science. Critics of Kant, um, of whom there are many, <clears throat> suggest, uh, for example, like Etienne Gilson, the Catholic philosopher, early 20th century, who, by the way, um, taught for a while at the uh, University of Toronto um, when the Pontifical Institute for Medieval Studies was um, uh, inaugurated um, just after World War II, if I recall. Etienne Gilson writes that critical realism, he says, is self-contradictory, like the notion of squaring a circle. You can start with thought or with being, but you cannot do both at the same time. Though from Gilson's perspective, the problem of critical realism is having your cake and eating it too. You're trying to uh, have a philosophy that begins with thought um, and at the same time um, uh, asserts um, an understanding of existence or some notion of existence anyway. So critical, critical realism is certainly contested. A contemporary or recent uh, scholar by the name of Kies van Kooten Niekerk um, describes, uh, and he's somewhat sympathetic to critical realism. Niekerk says that the qualification critical uh, distinguishes critical realism from so-called naive realism, which claims that reality is as it is perceived. Okay. so. When, when we use the term or the expression critical realism, uh, what we're doing here is we're establishing that unlike naive realists who suppose that um, what is perceived is what is simply known, um, simply, um, Niekirk, say, Niekirk says, suggests that this critical realism is a critique of that naive uh, position. Um, Another way of uh, thinking about this, we can refer, to, I think, to um, a theologian by the name of Hans Urs von Balthasar, uh, who, who, um, who uh, 20th century theologian, who made, I think, uh, and of course he's not alone, but this is an important qualification to think or to uh, assert regarding any form of uh, knowledge. Von Balthasar writes, the particular nature of one's subject matter must be reflected, first of all, in the particular nature of one's method. And so I think this is a salutary uh, warning or um, qualification on any, uh, any claim of knowledge, namely that knowledge comes about through a method. And we're inclined to say, uh, and we do say, when we know something, we know it through 
uh, discipline. And this is, um, of course, very important, I think, to uh, assert and, and argue for, not just assert, but argue for, especially in a day, a day and age such as ours, when um, for all kinds of cultural and social reasons that are very complicated, uh, sometimes the there's there's a lot of suspicion around expert knowledge or experts in general. Um, and I think expertise is something we have to uh, more and more claim and describe in terms of a particular method and be humble about what methods or particular methods can provide us, um, which is to say something real, real achievements, real, really achieved knowledge um, it comes about, but nevertheless, it's, n it's never uh, totalizing or certain. And this is, uh, I think, something that is, uh, that stems from or is related to what Tom Balthazar is getting at. So I want to go uh, and perhaps begin with uh, Ian Barber, who is often regarded as the father of science and religion dialogue. Um, Barber died in 2013, and his early adoption of critical realism, um, Barber himself is a trained physicist, but he, was, he's also, um, he also taught and, and was very well versed in um, theologically sympathetic religious studies. And Barber was one of the early thinkers, and by early I mean he was writing in the mid-1960s uh, in one of his first, if not first, book titled Issues in Science and Religion, from which this little quote comes, where he writes, critical realism acknowledges the indirectness of reference and the realistic intent of language as used in the scientific community. Um, I hinted this uh, a little bit further on in my presentation today, but I'll mention it now because it's relevant to Barber himself, who uh, was a physicist. Um, many physicists with a philosophical and religious inclination really absorbed the full-on impact that quantum mechanics uh, and um, theories such as the, that of um, the indeterminism principle really absorbed how this had an impact on their view of, of the world and their view of knowledge uh, in general. And I think it's fair to say that Barber um, saw some uh, parallels between his work as a scientist, specifically as a physicist, and his work as a theologically sym sympathetic uh, scholar of religion. And Barber, of course, attempted or, or um, engaged in work that had a very large sort of tapestry. He touched on a great number of topics in the history and contemporary survey of science and religion in his writings. And his books are to this day regarded as sort of the master texts that, that give a sort of a, a great overview. Um, and so I think it's important. Indeed, I think it's very significant that Barber with his interdisciplinary perspective, uh, early on adopted uh, critical realism as a, as a way of speaking of, of knowledge. And I want to agree with Barber's intent here. Um, I want to uh, indicate my agreement with his, um, his perspective on, on language, with his uh, perhaps nuanced perspective on reference here. The idea that, as Barber uh, again wrote in uh, in another book uh, titled, if I'm recalling correctly, "Myths, Models, and Paradigms," uh, Barber certainly saw how scientists and religious scholars use uh, metaphors repeatedly, use models, and engage in modeling repeatedly. I mean, how many times, just to choose a common sense example from our current day, do we read of the modeling of the COVID-19 uh, virus? Modeling is an essential enterprise in science. Uh, sim similarly, modeling uh, and the, the modeling of God's work in the world is uh, ubiquitous. We see in the work of theologians um, descriptions that are essentially models. Um, backed up by and supported by metaphorical language, often biblical, though not always. 
there's also a heavy use of analogy, much heavier in theology than in science. But I think you get you get the picture, namely that these ways of using language, these ways of indicating inference, there are many, there are indeed many parallels uh, across the disciplines in sciences and in theology. And this was sufficient for Barber and others um, whose names I've already dropped. Barber, P uh, Polkinghorne, um, Peacock, Alistair McGrath, Ernan McMullen, to some extent, sufficient for them to also um, see the value of critical realism. So what does it mean? How can we, how can we take it forward? So what I want to uh, suggest then is the idea that critical realism describes an epistemic perspective in theology equally as much as it depicts the scientific process because it should refer to a cognitively general form of inference and reference. So where I'm going with this, um, I mean, there's several, there's several threads that will come out in my presentation today. One of the most important, I think, is this idea that judgment, um, that general um, cognitive act that theologians, scientists, philosophers, uh, people engaged in everyday acts, we engage in these all the time. And sometimes we do it well, other times we do it uh, poorly but we nevertheless do engage in, engage in acts of judgment. Um, so, and I'm not going to claim that making judgments is the only thing that, uh, that connects or bridges science and theology, but it's certainly one of the most important things. So one might ask the question, okay, if critical realism is all I'm saying it's cracked up to be, well, what is the difference? I mean, there are obvious differences between theology and the sciences. Um, one can think only of the uh, objects involved. Uh, physics engages with the physical world in one at the macro or micro level. Theology certainly historically uh, is about the, uh, the reality of God and all of, that, all of uh, what stems from God and God's God's works and and God's word, so there's clear differences in terms of the object, uh, and that that goes back to my quote from Balthazar on my first slide at the bottom there. Right, it's one's subject matter and one's method that's important. But I want to get a little bit more specific than that. I think there is another difference, um, and I want to press this point a little bit later on. And it's the presence or the absence of verification. Scientific method, or methods if you prefer, um, is certainly about many things. Verification or processes of verification, uh, conducting experiments, trying to prove or disprove as the common language goes, theories or hypotheses. This is simply par for the course. Verification is often ascribed to be central to the scientific method. Now, as I say in my qualifying remark there, it may be too optimistic to speak of a single scientific method. And there are philosophers of science who, who do believe that indeed, there is no such thing as a scientific method. It's too simplistic. What the physicist does working on a computer uh, compared with what a, a, a biologist does, does in a wet lab, compared with what a zoologist does, compared with a, a virologist and so on and so forth, these, the kinds, the range of activities in these various disciplines seems to be, uh, for many, evidence that there's, that it's impossible to describe a single scientific method. In any case, I don't have a, a particular stake in that argument. Um, but it is certainly in the background here when we speak of the difference between science and theology. And I wanna say that because so many sciences give evidence for their um, working with evidence, right? Their, their focus on 
verification seems to be very important in a way that has no analog in theology. Well, maybe not no analog. You'll see that there, I think, is uh, perhaps some uh, analogy, but it's, uh, it's, it's rather on the small side. So my argument uh, on, this, on this slide what I, that I say here is critical realism best describes how to affirm reality in cognitional judgments whilst conceding the variety of historical paradigms that have affected how we know things to be true. Okay, so critical realism does capture that essential element, which is our, our, um, our use of our judgment. Even while across different historical periods and across different disciplines, how we know things to be true does indeed differ. I want to make an additional point, which is the second sentence on this slide. I think that critical realism can help us understand how to do theology, notably with respect to scriptural testimony and doctrinal claims that were written and formulated in different cultures and in, in accord with different assumptions than our own assumptions about, about the world or how the world works. So critical realism, I think, is very important. And here I'll, I'll fast forward to an aspect of my conclusion, which is when we think about um, the development of Christian doctrine over time, over 2,000 years um, of time, it's uh, often been alleged in various ways that the differences between Christian ideas on this or that topic in the first century, the differences between the first century and the 21st century are so dramatic, it is claimed, that, um, that it's enough to be um, elide or put aside the idea that Christian thought, Christian doctrine is constant or consistent. Um, I would say in response that so long as we have an understanding of doctrinal development, so long as we have this um, kind of bedrock way of thinking about knowledge, namely critical realism, uh, then I think we can uh, help salvage or defend uh, theology as an enterprise that's not completely um, um, subject to historical uh, taste or cultural taste. Okay, so some, um, again, some, some pillars of where I'm, I'm coming from, and I just, I'm going to range, I'm, I'm, as you can see, I'm not giving a, a, a tight paper, um, you know, I'm not reading from a paper, and in part that's due to the fact that we're doing this virtually, and, uh, and it's, it's a bit difficult, I think, for, uh, for people to uh, grab on to the sort of the finer nuance, nuances from um, uh, from sort of tight arguments. So I'm going to range a, a little bit and, and try and lay down the core ideas and kind of hope that inductively um, something of my argument will, will come across. So one of the uh, philosophers and, the, and who is also a theologian um, on, on whom I rely for uh, some sort of the, the bedrock um, perspective from, that I'm coming from is the thought of Bernard Lonergan, who um, was a Canadian theologian and a philosopher. He was also a mathematician and an amateur economist to boot. Um, and he, he dabbled in a couple of other fields as well. Uh, so he was a bit of a Renaissance man. Um, as I say, he died in 1984 um, and arguably, well, I don't think it's much of an argument, but I probably his most well-known work is uh, the philosophical text Insight, which runs to 750 pages. And, uh, and this was published in 1957. Uh, it earned Lonergan a, a mention in Time magazine at the time. Um, in any case, uh, Lonergan as uh, a trained mathematician and so, and as a Jesuit uh, theologian himself, he had, um, he had, I think, a rather refined understanding uh, as to some of the biases that go into thinking about knowledge. 
And so one of those biases typically runs that you have knowledge provided by scientists on the one hand, and then you have everyone else over on the other hand who express various sorts of beliefs. So this kind of popular understanding that knowledge and belief are in two different universes, epistemologically speaking, uh, is something that Lonergan set about to, I think, correct. Um, so he writes into well into his book, Insight, we are accustomed to think of scientists as pioneers in a novel and daring adventure of exploration. But the fact is that modern science has had four centuries in which to develop a traditionalist mentality. The difference between knowledge and belief lies not in the object, but in the attitude of the subject. Knowing is affirming what one correctly understands in one's own experience. Belief is accepting what we are told by others on whom we reasonably rely. So I think this is an exceptionally important point that Lonergan uh, makes. And I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that Lonergan is the only one who makes this point about the relationship between knowledge and belief. Um, another name that some of you may have come across in this context is that of Michael Polanyi, P-O-L-A-N-Y-I. Uh, and Polanyi has a, a, a several important texts on this point. Um, and so one of the points that Polanyi as well as Lonergan makes is that belief is an exceptionally important component part of the enterprise of science. Um, the, the sort of the, the example that I've used with students in a classroom when I've taught this material before is that when a chemist walks into her lab at 9 a.m. in the morning, it's really important that that chemist um, takes on belief that the periodic table uh, on which so much, many other chemists and scientists have collaborated in order to make um, a real aspect of, of scientific bedrock uh, knowledge, she must believe, uh, I would say she's obliged to believe in the periodic table. Um, even though she's only testing or working with one particular implication of the periodic table on any given day. I think you see the point here, which is that knowledge and belief are interwoven aspects. And I'm, I'm, I think Lonergan's point about knowledge is something that is uh, one on one's own, or, or one, W-O-N, something that is achieved on the part of a group of uh, like a team of uh, inquirers or investigators, whereas belief is something that is received. Um, and there's a passive element to accepting um, on the basis uh, uh, on uh, as a matter of belief, the knowledge that is gained by others on whom we rely. So that's a first um, and I think essential bedrock aspect to my point about critical realism. Okay, so working up to my um, point about critical realism, I wanna to just touch on a couple of uh, critiques. And again, this is not going to be exhaustive um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there are critiques against critical realism, um, uh, critiques ag against realism per se that are pretty common. Um, one of these critiques concerns what is called the problem of underdetermination. Um, so, if you uh, if you search the term underdetermination in you know a, like a library um, a database, for example, you will you will find plenty of articles that deal with the problem. Most of which I think would be found in our um, journals of uh, in the philosophy of science. So. Under determination, um, on, on one definition of underdetermination, would say, for instance, that uh, all theories or hypotheses, models, etc., are underdetermined by logic and all possible evidence. This leaves a gap 
a gap between logic and evidence on the one hand and theory choice on the other, which is inevitably filled by contextual factors. So the problem under determination um, and, and why, why people choose not to be realists about the scientific enterprise by extension is because of this gap. The gap between uh, logic and evidence on the one hand and the theory on the other hand. The idea here, the idea of the, the, the criticism is that when scientists say, well, you know, evidence X proves theory Y, the, the critic says, no, theory Y is a leap. It's a leap of faith even. To choose one theory as a means of explaining a particular empirical event um, or a particular data is always going to be um, something that underdetermined. There, there could be rival theories, right? There could be other hypotheses that account for the very same data, the very same events to which you are uh, referring or hoping to refer. So this is the problem of underdetermination. It's, I would say, largely a logical point and um, it's not uninformed. Indeed, it's heavily informed by lots of historical evidence to suggest that there the, the rival theories of particular, um, uh, particular phenomena um, coexisted for uh, quite a long time. The you know, rival theories can seem to be equally relevant, equally plausible theories to account for particular phenomena. And so this is a hi historical evidence for underdetermination. Okay. So that's one criticism against critical realism. And here's a second one. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to be exhaustive here. I'm looking at the clock and I don't want to take up too much time. But here is a second, second critique uh, against realism or uh, against critical realism even. And it comes from Thomas, to, uh, Th Thomas Kuhn, pictured on the right. So in the first crit, uh, criticism, um, you'll notice if you can see my uh, cursor, there that a leap to a particular theory in order to explain particular phenomena is filled by contextual factors. Well, what might those contextual factors be? Thomas Kuhn and others, in uh, in you know in in a variety of 20th century criticisms of realist uh, philosophy of science, have alleged, have stated in various ways that there are particular, very subjective, very contingent, historical values that go into a scientist's inquiry, and many times. So Kuhn and others argued, many times scientists are not willing to admit that these values or contextual factors, motivations, many scientists were not willing to admit that they were present, animating, feeding a particular preference for this or that theory. So as a, as a result of this um, observation or uh, yeah, observation about uh, about how science works. Kuhn said, "Well, it seems to it seems to me," said Kuhn, "that uh, science proceeds uh, much less logically than we were than we previously believed. Um, science is a lot messier than we previous believed. Science," he went further. "Science proceeds according to changes in paradigm." All of a sudden things change and that's because the, 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 the theory just cannot withstand anymore the, um, the complexities, the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the evidence that seems to suggest that the theory might not be right, but the theory is nevertheless trying to account for data that are a bit different from the initial data, et cetera. Eventually the, a theory falls apart 
And in Kuhn's language, we go from normal science to revolutionary science. And so a new paradigm emerge, emerges. And Kuhn initially wrote uh, in the Structures of Scientific Revolutions, one of the most, one of the best-selling uh, texts in the philosophy of science in the 20th century, if not the best-selling text. And by the way, one of the most widely read texts in uh, liberal arts colleges in the, in the last 40 years. Thomas Kuhn wrote in that book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and I quote, when paradigms change, there are usually significant shifts in the criteria determining the legitimacy both of problems and of proposed solutions. That is why the choice between competing paradigms regularly raised questions that cannot be resolved by the criteria of normal science. Meaning that a strictly rule-based or uh, falsification-based understanding of science that is premised on the role of deduction or a simple induction, et cetera, et cetera. That portrait of science just doesn't seem to work when these paradigm shifts uh, occur. So, um, so theory choice, right? The choice for the new theory uh, as against the old theory, the new theory seems to be animated by all kinds of other uh, factors. So competing paradigms are incommensurable and the incommensurability has to do with values. So quite a, quite a lot of subjective um, motivation go, uh, goes into the scientific enterprise. What is interesting, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm beginning with, uh, or not beginning with, but I'm, I'm here turning on Kuhn's words, uh, which come from the structure, and I'm sorry, I don't have the page number here. I pulled it from another text. Um, so this, this is around the, uh, around the 1970 mark. I think in the second edition of the, uh, of the structures book. Seven years later, Kuhn had changed his mind. There's a famous quote that I think um, was, uh, was put out by a philosopher of science. I think it was by Bas van Frost and it doesn't matter. Um, but van, uh, but uh, Thomas Kuhn realized that many of his own followers were drawing conclusions about the existence of paradigms and paradigm shifts in scientific history, they were drawing conclusions that, well, the whole scientific enterprise is kind of relativistic, isn't it? And Kuhn resisted that. He, he, was, actually, uh, he was actually horrified that many were taking his historical uh, inquiries and drawing conclusions that he disagreed with. So he wrote seven years later, um, after he wrote Structures, he wrote, I have implicitly assumed that whatever their initial source, the criteria or values deployed in theory choice are fixed once and for all. Okay. This, is a, this is a change of tune or change in emphasis anyway. Um, and, and this is very, very important um, to, to note. I'll just continue the quote. Uh, fixed once and for all, unaffected by their transition from one theory to another. Roughly speaking, but only roughly speaking, I take that to be the case. If the list of relevant values be kept short, I have mentioned five, not all independent, and if their specification be left vague, then such values as accuracy, scope, fruitfulness are permanent attributes of science. I, I should have underlined that word permanent. Permanent attributes of science. This is a uh, Kuhn's 1977 book, um, forget the title. Um, another philosopher of science whom I'm relying on in my presentation here adds um, simplicity and consistency to those three uh, virtues or values just mentioned. So what am I doing here? I'm, I'm drawing on the work of the historian Thomas Kuhn, whose work has been interpreted to suggest an anti-realist perspective on scientific findings, that theory choice is subjective, that historical revolutions in scientific knowledge 
leave us or should leave us very uncomfortable with making deterministic claims about things that exist in the real world, independent of our minds. But having made that inquiry, having made those kinds of claims earlier on, Kuhn steps back from the brink in the mid 1970s and says, actually, there are permanent features of science that I want to underline here. And these are the values that scientists use in their actual scientific work when they are choosing the theory that explains the data or phenomena they're investigating. So to my mind, this is very important um, because what it shows is that from a realist perspective, um, historical change is not the problem that many have uh, claimed it to be. If we, on historical scrutiny of changes in theory over time, we can see that cognitionally, scientists are coming or drawing conclusions, making judgments based on a set number and set types of criteria that they use to judge the veracity or lack of veracity of a particular theory. And Kuhn goes as far as to call that a permanent feature of science. So I think this is a very important point, and I think it's a basis upon which we can then use that, those words <laughs> from a, histori a historian of science, uh, uh, such as Thomas Kuhn, um, and build a form of critical realism uh, in response. So I just have a couple more slides uh, as this pertains to science, and then I'm going to switch gears and talk about uh, uh, Christian theology. I'm just going to stop here because I see that there may be some comments in the chat, and I just want to go back and uh, and see there if I can respond or see if there's anything that pertains directly to uh, what I'm dealing with here. Hold on a second. Okay. Okay, so someone's made a comment about the psychology and I'll get to that in a minute. Right, okay. Okay, I think those comments are, um, I don't think there's anything I need to respond to right away, but if I'm, uh, but if you wanna come back to it and the conversation or the discussion afterwards, please do so. Okay, so my, re my response or a critical realist response to um, the uh, dependence on certain set values in theory, choice and science. So we want to say that this is actually something that's routine in science, and Kuhn, in fact, said that. Um, Ernan McMullen, a philosopher of science, uh, and I haven't introduced him properly yet, um, but he's the uh, philosopher and historian of science. He died in 2000 and he, uh, sorry, 2015, I think, um, and he's the subject of uh, my doctoral thesis, more or less. McMullen wrote, to accept a theory is to be committed to exploring its potential. Scientists can be said to accept to one degree or another the theory they are working with. Scientists and philosophers of science alike find no difficulty in accepting the major theories that form the background of current scientific work. So this is an important qualification that McMullen introduces here, namely that to accept a, a theory does not mean to suggest that a particular theory is final uh, or certainly not certain. Um, to, to accept a theory means to use it in a provisional way. And so that word provisional is something that I want to um, uh, uphold or uh, hold out here as part and parcel of what a critical realist uh, affirms. Critical realists uh, want to emphasize that they are speaking about a reality or a part, uh, an entity's reality. Critical realists are reluctant to 
say too much about truth. So the emphasis here, um, and this is I'm drawing on, just making some points based on McMullen's uh, contribution as a philosopher and as a historian. The emphasis here is on reality, not on truth. It's on ontology rather than epistemology. So a uh, particular, uh, so accepting a theory and using a particular set of uh, values such as, is that theory fruitful? Is it consistent with other theories? Um, is it adequate? Is it empirically adequate? Does it account for the actual uh, evidence uh, and so forth? Are these values that we're employing, does that speak to reality? We don't want to speak about the truth yet because that's um, to, to speak so glibly or to, uh, to, um, to casually about truth suggests that a particular formulation will uh, will necessarily be valid across time. But formulations, like a theory's formulation, is, is not necessarily valid across time. It's a tool for working through a particular problem and establishing the reality of something, even though it's, it's uh, in, in, like kind of fuzzy. Um, another uh, thing that McMullen did, which was very important based on what, uh, what Thomas Kuhn was at, go, getting at in his work, is to distinguish between epistemic and non-epistemic values in theory choice. Now, I know this is a bit of a mouthful. Essentially, what we're getting at here is the very important task of distinguishing between a, uh, a criteria, a value, that's internal to the scientific inquiry on the one hand, and a value that is external uh, may have to do with the psychological motivation of the investigator, may have to do with the religious background of the investigator, may have to do with the upbringing of the investigator who was led to um, choose a particular science uh, scientific career for personal reasons. I mean, but these are external, even though they have an impact on the work of the scientist, but they are nevertheless properly external to the internal uh, logic of theory choice. So it's important to, to distinguish between these different values that are at work. And it's a messy business trying to dis make that distinction, but it's an important dis distinction to make clear. And then the other point here is that the truth of explanations are always context specific. Uh, the classic example, of course, has to, is gravity, right? Um, you know, Newton's theory of gravity is actually still pretty adequate when you're dealing with, you know, uh, like 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 spatial objects in in sort of common sense, um, uh, you know, real world applications. Um, and so, you know, the apocryphal story of the apple dropping from the tree onto Newton's head and all that kind of business. Um, we know that it, there's a particular explanation about the relationship between force and mass in Newton that only carries over to some extent in Einsteinian um, formulations about uh, gravity, right? But Newton's explanation is still valid within that frame of reference. The point is that the frame of reference uh, in physics has expanded exponentially. Um, and so the truth of an explanation is always relative to a frame of reference. So it's always important, and this is the, um, this is I think the, uh, the qualification on, uh, on epistemology. Critical real realism has to do with the reality, but the truth of explanations of particular formulations is always going to be relative to a particular frame of reference, right? And so you, we can see this in terms of causality. Michael Polanyi and others have used examples like, well, what causes a pot of water to boil? It depends on what your frame of reference is, right? Is it the fact that I wanted tea? Is it the particular uh, transference of uh, electric into uh, thermal or kinetic energy? Right, there's different, there's different um, causes, right? We can you you can use the Aristotelian <laughs> uh, distinction of different causes to explain why a pot of uh, water comes to uh, boil, uh, with 
obviously the final cause being uh, of most interest to human beings uh, who may want to make a cup of tea out of the, uh, the pot of boiling water. The point is that you can have different explanations that are uh, that coexist, right? So in any case, that's um, that's one of the reasons why critical realists are reluctant to to be too certain about particular uh, about particular explanations or even about explanations um, at all. Um, John Polkinghorne, whose name I've mentioned already, he has applied critical realism as a physicist, um, and he adopted the particular um, uh, expression that epistemology models ontology, meaning that the totality of what we can know is a reliable guide to what is the case. Um, so um, Polkinghorn was very much affected as with uh, Barber and other physicists about the uncertainty relation, the, um, the indeterminacy of the quantum world. Uh, at the micro level. And that seemed to suggest uh, for him that what was the case at the, at the level um, of ontology is already reflected in epistemology. It's not that we're ignorant, it's just that there's, there's um, our, our, our understanding or our explanation of things are going to bump up against in, inherent indeterminacy. So this is a complex relationship between epistemology and ontology that, uh, that, that many have grappled with. Polkinghorne's interesting because he, uh, again, wants to use this as a basis for talking about uh, creation um, as, as himself as an Anglican priest. He thinks of creation as something very much open-ended, indeterminate. And he, so that pertains to his understanding of, uh, of God and God's purposes in creation. Okay, so I just have uh, some uh, finishing remarks then as, as this all applies to uh, theology. Does theology need to be critically realist? And I'm going to hedge my response to this question in light of what I've been saying um, and say yes, yes and no, or no and yes. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so theology is not critically realist in the same way that science is. Um, for one thing, theology does not study the same reality. Theology is not a scientific discipline um, that possesses theoretical frameworks for, for assessment or verification, experimentation or explanations. Um, just even thinking of the use of the word progress in theology, that's <laughs> it's pretty rare. Whereas we like to think at least that in science we have something like progress uh, occurring or recurring. On the other hand, yes, faith is a form of knowledge um, and so theology structures itself analogous to, analogously to scientific claims, but it's oriented to meaning as established by God. And of course, that's the difference, but there's some structural analogy, I would argue. Um, if we start with Hebrews 11, where faith is uh, explained, described as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, this then seems to be premise enough for an enterprise such as Christian theology to talk about things that we hope for and things that are unseen, of which I think we can all agree there are plenty. Um, critical realism in a theological context means that reason needs faith and faith is uh, a kind of extrapolation but there are extrapolations uh, uh, that are uh, in, internal, I think, to scientific practice, a lot of them. Um, in his, uh, one of his major works, The Literal Meaning of the Book of Genesis, Augustine writes, by another kind of knowledge, we conclude that there is in nature some hidden force by which latent forms are brought into view. The principle which makes this development possible is hidden to the eyes, but not to the mind. Um, again, I refer back to the point I made at the beginning about the importance of judgment. So I think human beings are inclined to, when seeing something like uh, the telos or the goal orientation of the world, of forces in nature uh, that seem to defy uh, simpler 
uh, causal explanations, uh, I think it is not just tempting, but it is indeed plausible that we should turn to another explanation along a very different frame of reference, namely that of God vis-a-vis -vis a creation. Natural theology is one form of theology which seems particularly applicable to uh, a critically realist approach. Um, and so here we, we come to the, um, the additional uh, way in which the, 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 the biblical text figures, but I'll just hold off for now and just um, quote something that comes from McMullen who writes, for Augustine, the term literal signified the meaning that the author intended. Okay. Um, I won't read the, the rest of the quote for now, but just to, to keep that bold uh, portion of the text in mind. So if we have what is evidently clear that the, there is authorial intent, we say that the Bible, is, typically Christians say that the Bible or the scripture is inspired by God, right? That is so to speak of inspired, implies intent on the part of the author, right? But we, um, we don't necessarily know all of the details of the author's intent, but that's okay. As far as Augustine's concerned, what the term literal means is simply that the author intended some general meaning. So I continue, in some contexts, this might be literal in our sense of the word, in others, it could be metaphorical, for example, the right hand of God, or it could be a parable. In this work, Augustine hoped that he had hit upon the meaning that the author, God and the human author, as one, must have intended, though he was willing to allow that others might disagree. So the intention of the biblical author the intention of God as author of the world, understand, understood as the works or the work of God in general. There's some intention there that um, is on a realist view, um, assumed to be, uh, in, you know, we can investigate that, we can probe it, we can think about it. So just uh, in ending, I have a couple of slides on, on the Bible. I, I'm looking at the clock, so I, I actually will skip over some of these, um, some of these issues. I'm, I'm referring to a, a work that was, uh, it's actually written quite a number of years ago by Ben Meyer, a biblical scholar who worked for a time at uh, McMaster Divinity in Hamilton, Ontario. And the book, it's, I think it's hard to find these days, but it's Critical Realism in the New Testament. So a couple of the claims that come out of this, this text, which are really important. Texts have a primary claim on the reader, an intended authorial intent, filtered by genre, right? So the critical, historically inclined investigation of a reader is bound to see and understand the differences in genre. The genre of the book of Genesis is very different from the genre of the Acts of the Apostles. Very different again from the genre of the book of um, uh, Lamentations or Proverbs. Okay. The different biblical genres then are, uh, are important for the reader as subject um, to take into account in our critical appraising of what do we know when we know an author's intent because the different kinds of authors, different kinds of texts and so forth. Um, words are signs of point D on the slide that, uh, that's on, this, on the screen here. Words are signs. The biblical text is comprised of words as signs. This is a way of thinking of how God is both present and absent in the biblical text. I've referred earlier to the importance of the unseen. Um, even in, in science, we have invisible entities. Uh, physicists, of course, are uh, the most prominent in this regard to speak about what is invisible. And so much of 20th century thinking about science was predicated on, mistakenly, I, I, I would say, uh, predicated on the importance of what is seen. 
right? That evidence should be seen or visible. Um, I think it's important to see a connection between so much of science, especially now, which is about the invisible, but which is theoretically known or known about. This is obviously something that we can carry over into theology, uh, the importance of knowing what is invisible. Um, okay, I got a few more, a couple more slides there. I'm not going to stop. These are essentially ideas that I've uh, pulled out from Ben Meyer's work. But I'm, I, I want to end with, uh, with a reference to a contemporary biblical theologian, uh, N.T. Wright, who is um, in his multi-volume work on the, uh, on the New Testament, actually begins that multi-volume work with a chapter on critical realism. Um, and uh, while some of us wish that he had said more about critical realism, there's lots in his scholarship that suggests a critical realist approach. For example, his reference to worldviews. He writes in his New Testament and the People of God book, worldviews are the basic stuff of human existence, the lens through which the world is seen. I'll stop there. Again, I don't want to belabor the point. So the, the lens through which we see is very important for a biblical scholar to realize in terms of understanding how the biblical text is understandable for us, but in light of how it would have been understood in the first century, because there was a whole different worldview at, at stake in the first century. But Wright says that we need to appropriate, we need to interpret what was the case in the first century in terms that make sense to us. But we cannot do that. We cannot do that unless we know and understand the difference between the different worldviews. So it's, a, it's, an, it's essentially it's a historical task, but it's the critical part of a critical realism that Wright is saying has to be front and center of a biblical scholars or a biblical theologian's approach. Last slide. Uh, let's speak about the object then. Christian, and I'm here. I'm just picking on a, the, an example of the uh, the example of the resurrection as an objective mind independent event. Well, Christian reuse of resurrection language is astonishingly free of vague and generalized speculation. He's actually referring here to first uh, first century church. Uh, use of resurrection language. It is crisp and clear. Resurrection means going through death and out the other side into a new mode of existence. Christian reuse of resurrection language is, uh, I've repeated myself, astonishingly free of vague and generalized speculation. The only explanation for their behavior, the behavior of the early Christians, for their stories, their symbols, and their theology is that they really believe Jesus had been bodily raised from the dead. So to end, there's an approach or an application of critical realism that I think is not only salvageable, but is actually very much alive in the work of current theologians such as N.T. Wright. And we see it there in his, work, in his use of language, in his understanding of history. There is this objective event which took took place, the event of the resurrection. But note the plurality of what a biblical scholar has to work with. The behavior of the early churches and the early Christians, their stories, note the plural, their symbols, note the plural, and then their theology, okay, which is a term for, uh, for, the, for the total uh, sum of theological knowledge at, at the time. This is, uh, I think this speaks to the value or the enduring value of a critical realism because there are many things to take account of when assessing uh, claims of knowledge. Uh, we know that there, as Christians, we know that there is this reality of the resurrection, explaining it um, in, in, the, in terms of one simple formulation is very difficult to do beyond simply an attestation, uh, which is why that's what we have in the Nicene Creed, for example, is an attestation 
that there is uh, that there that uh, that the resurrection of the dead takes place first and foremost in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So um, I'm going to end it there. I hope I've been able to establish some points of connection between theology uh, and science um, in regards the epistemological problem of critical realism. I realize that I've been speaking for quite long and I apologize. I meant to stop a few minutes earlier than I did. Um, in any case, I turn it over to, uh, to Gordon and the others to, uh, to hear what you now have to say in response. Thank you very much, Paul. I'd like to, if you could possibly comment on your statement that uh, you have no particular stake, as I recall the statement, but in, in a single, in no single scientific method. Uh, it's always been my sense that uh, there's a huge stake uh, in recognizing that there's no single scientific method. But that's partly because I sit in, in the, the infant discipline of the geosciences. And in the geosciences, there are distinct differences from the standard physics model. Uh, it's fundamentally the discovery of, the modern discovery of time in geoscience is a, the main contribution to thinking and is extremely different from the activities that go in a laboratory. So I would, I've always, in my um, approach to speaking about a Christian's view of, uh, of uh, science, that uh, there's no single scientific perspective or method. Uh, it is a, a mixed bag of very important tools, um, but uh, it does not constitute uh, access to absolute truth or consistency. I, I really appreciate your comments on that perspective. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think I, I, I agree with your, your observation and uh, what I have um, recent, uh, I've read more recently in a, in a, in a work uh, of theology and science is, a, uh, uh, is on a study of what goes on in, in various high schools in particular where uh, and I and I got this in my own science education in high school, where it's very much drummed into students at a young age that there is a single scientific method. And I think the trick or the task before us is to perhaps uh, pull away from the claim that there is a single method, and yet still instill among students a, um, an appreciation, a profound appreciation for uh, all of, the, all of the, the truth and the reality that the scientific disciplines uncover. I think one of the things that I most appreciated or got out of the thought of Erna McMullen is his approach or his, uh, his study of inference the way in which scientists make inferences um, and the, yes, the plurality of different forms of inference that scientists use. Generally, it's been supposed in, in, a, in earlier time that science either proceeded deductively, um, Aristotle is a certain way of, uh, is a certain reference point there, or uh, alternatively, inductively, uh, that, that it's science is simply a, a matter of sort of continually gathering evidence and data and sort of mashing it together. And Thomas uh, uh, Francis Bacon is the uh, figure often cited in, in that context. McMullen, based on his study of Galileo, especially, um, and some of his 20th century scientists, um, formulated on the basis of the work of Charles Sanders Peirce, P-E-I-R-C-E, -E, um, a theory of retroduction, which is a, I won't get into the details, but essentially the point is that um, deduction and induction are not simple choices 
uh, between which we need to choose. Rather, they are forms of inference that coexist in most, if not all, of the scientific disciplines, um, depending on what, what the task is. Um, and so, especially, you know, if it's formulating a hypothesis, there might, there might be a deduction or a set of deductions that need to take place as opposed to verifying a hypothesis in which um, some kind of um, inductive approach is deemed necessary, whether in, you know, in, usually in an experiment. Um, in any case, I'm only really underlying the point that you made, which is that there is a plurality to methods. I think we do best by emphasizing actual cognitional acts or inferences so that people can understand very concretely what goes into uh, the scientific process. Thank you. Gord, you had, you had May some go questions? ahead, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm LT Jayachandran from India. People call me LT. Uh, on my work on the Trinity, I'm so happy that Paul mentioned Michael Polanyi. Uh, the connection between epistemology and ontology is so clearly seen in the being of God, Trinity, because uh, from a philosophical point of view, uh, epistemology has no starting point unless you assume a subject who knows, an object who is known, and a medium through whom uh, that knowledge is communicated, which you have only in the Trinitarian understanding of God. And that interestingly combines induction and deduction subjective and the objective, and becomes the basis for critical realism. That is how I'm beginning to look at it. Now, I'm not a, a philosopher, I'm not a theologian, I'm a structural engineer, but um, I've written a, a monograph on the Trinity that is simply, of course, not including Christian realism, but I mean, critical realism. But I believe that uh, the points that we have made, I mean, excellent uh, presentation by Paul, thank you. Uh, I think the starting point is the being of God, and that lays the foundation when it is applied to the observable world in this uh, apparent paradox where we have all this uh, criticalism. Just an observation, uh, but Paul, if you would like to comment on it, I would be very grateful. Yes, thank you for that. It's, um... I, I didn't. I didn't get into the, the Trinity or into some specifics about uh, about um, thinking of critical realism in the kind of more doctrinal theology. Um, but yes, you're quite right. I'm. I've uh, having read the work of John Zizioulas a few years ago. Um, I've I've seen growing the growing importance in my own thinking of the uh, the fact that we we use the terms person, the, the term persons to describe the three persons of God. And I mean, of course, there's, there's the analogy and the disanalogy that are simultaneously present. When, when we come to speak of the persons, the three persons of God, we are talking about persons who, again, analogously are active and passive. And there's technical terms that theologians have introduced to talk about the perfection of the activity of the, of the Trinitarian persons. Uh, but one thing we can take away from that is that um, if we go, instead of going from science to theology, if we go from theology to science, what is the model of a, uh, an investigating humble scientist um, going on um, what, what a what a, what a divine person is. I think there's much to, to learn there. And of course, in the Christian tradition, some of the, the details of, of that modeling, many uh, details of that modeling were provided precisely in an incarnate form, namely in the life of Jesus. Yeah. Thank you. In fact, that would be from an academic from an academic I, point of view, that would be interesting uh, to develop how uh, the doctrine of the Trinity provides a basis for critical realism. I mean, that's the point. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. That's and thank you. That's an that's an excellent point, and it was it was the more obvious thing that I should have gravitated to. Yeah. 
I didn't I didn't get into a discussion of doctrinal development. I know. And so yes, there is and there is quite a bit of theology or theological work done on how do you get how do you get to the Trinity from the biblical text? Because of course the Trinity as Trinity is not the term is not used in any biblical text, and yet it's a central doctrinal um, claim of, of the of the Christian world. Um, so I think that's actually a, a classic case of a particular formulation that uh, goes beyond the early evidence of the of the first century church, but we know it's already we it's it's in use by the late second century, uh, probably earlier than that, but certainly by the time Tertullian and Irenaeus come along. So um, that there's a critical realist trajectory to that doctrinal development. And, and you're quite right, the Trinity is, is a, a, a great case in point. Well, it's, it's great to, to hear all the, the, the various nuances that you're offering us and looking at <clears throat> different types of knowledge, uh, well, particularly scientific knowledge and theological knowledge. Um, very helpful. And, and I think, uh, sort of shows the importance of humility in the approach to one's claim to knowledge or claim to understanding. And, um, but I, there's still this uh, thing that bugs me. <laughs> it's the, you know, you mentioned the, the relationship between ontology and epistemology. And I think it seems that we get that mixed up quite a bit. And if we, we say ontology is prior, we, I think we agree that ontology is prior to epistemology, and then you get into various methodologies. But um, we particularly don't have this God's eye view <laughs> to say, yeah, <laughs> it's all there. Everything we talked about, the angels, everything. You know, right. In a sense, we're we're humbled. We're humbled by this task, aren't we? Mm -hmm. When we talk about ontology yeah. and uh, yeah. Trinity or that sort of thing. It's it's uh, it's great, but it's. It's important yeah. to avoid the extremes yeah, I think, in this, I think. Yeah, in, in fact, uh, yeah, th this, this, this question of epistemology and ontology is a very tricky one. I think it, um, it's present in large part, uh, I alluded to this, because many of the early science and religion work was done by physicists, who's uh, quite rightly, whose sense of um, the mystery of the world was much uh, was was very prominent. Um, perhaps, arguably, no offense to any biologists here, but uh, there's the sense of mystery was at, at, at a certain point in the 20th century more um, more perceptible than compared with the sense of mystery on on the part of biologists or other lab bench scientists or something like that. But I think I I want to go back to um, like you, you know, Gordon's brought up humility, and one of the uh, features of McMullen's formulation of realism is pr precisely the fact that it turns on uh, on on the need to be humble. And McMullen's emphasis on humility is an emphasis that is uh, made in light of his, the historical record. There's um, there's you know the historical record shows that. Uh, you know, scientific progress has come at a, a great cost, which is that previous theories had to go by the wayside. Previous explanations had to be rejected. Uh, previous sets of data were deemed irrelevant, et cetera. So yes, humility is, uh, is absolutely essential. Even when, when it comes to realism, you know, to, to, to say that in some way our, um, our theories about the world are the word that's used by Polkinghorne, especially as verisimilitudinous. Right. <laughs> In other words, like approaching to the truth, right? We don't have the total truth, we approach the truth. So McMullen picks up on this kind of theme and says, right, mm -hmm. you know, it's true. We realists uh, have a lot to say when it comes to the structural sciences. So um, Olaf mentioned the geosciences, right? So the sciences in which there are structural kinds of explanations, um, real uh, or macro world evidence, 
that is um, widely accessible to many uh, inquirers. That's where realism has a lot of traction, you know, even intuitively. Um, it gets less and less intuitive the more invisible and the more micro or the more really, really macro things become. So anti-vaxxers thrive in part on the invisibility of certain biological phenomena, right? So they are anti-realists, uh, you know, anti-vaxxers are, are, who knows how to describe the phenomenon, but you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. right? Like anti-realism is much more plausible um, when your ontology is around, is around the micro world. And in fact, this was a concern that McMullen expressed in his philosophy of science uh, on quite a number of occasions. And I think we can see some real world um, uh, evidence for this problem. It's, it's much easier to be anti-realist, the more, uh, pardon me, the less visible things are. <laughs> Good. Are there other questions? I, I, um, I have a couple of short questions. I want to thank Paul. Really excellent talk, and I got a lot out of it. Uh, I just have one question about Kant that was brought up at the beginning. Um, and he's he's saying that we can only know the phenomena. We uh, we we can't know the thing in itself. And would it be fair to say then that? It, critical realism is is taking a bit more optimistic view of things that we can know at least something approximation or approach truth as you were quoting Paul Kinghorn I think um, that might be true and this, the second one I think at some point we were talking about two different realities that uh, of theology and science or they're studying two different things wouldn't it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be more fair to say they're studying different aspects of one reality um, I wouldn't want to say science studies one thing and it, it, God is completely irrelevant to it uh, or, or because that, that kind of compartmentalizes it too much and makes theology from the scientific point of view seem to be unreal. Uh, so. Yeah, 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 uh, good, good, uh, really good points. Thank you. Um, briefly on your first point, uh, I think that uh, critical realists, uh, I, I think there's quite a difference between critical realism and Kantian philosophy. Um, critical realists, at least the more historically and scientifically, i.e. empirically inclined, the uh, worth of explanations and the uh, approximation to you know, the truth of a reality Kant was a lot more circumspect. You know, Kant and, and Kantian philosophers to this day uh, will be will will con, will content themselves with you know conceptual frameworks. And it's it um, I, I have not I have not found or read a Kantian uh, philosopher of science who uh, who seems to go outside that perspective. And that such a person may exist, but I don't know of it. Well, and I mentioned that. Partly because Kant himself, um, you know, he's responding in in large part to to well both Hume and, and and Newton. I mean, Kant himself is actually trying to engage the empirical world and as it was an emerging at his time. In any case, to your second point, I agree that science and theology do pertain to an overlapping reality, but it seems to me you need to be a Christian in order to say that. And that that's I'm I'm being a little bit controversial because it's 526 and it's, you know, our, it's, the day is long. It's important to stay awake. But uh, I think you need to be a Christian to say that because the, the promise of the resurrection and the resurrection body is very empirical. The, the doctrine or the theology of participation, the communion of saints, as, as Catholics would tend to emphasize, this is something that's very, well, participation is the indeed the overlapping of the temporal with the eternal and there's lots in the history of Christian theology to suggest that the eternal and the temporal are not side by side parallel realities but are indeed overlapping so I take overlapping. your uh, I take your point David thank you I think Michael wants to ask a question can you unmute yourself 
Sorry. Um, yes, I'm enjoying this too. But it seems to me realism cannot speak to the future, to what has not yet happened. And so there's something beyond reality, which can become a reality. And uh, I put a couple of chat lines in about Hannah Arendt, for example, who distinguishes willing, which is a is a light an aspect of mindfulness to thinking or knowing. So willing is, I believe, is closely connected to faith. And willing is to aim for that which is desired, but it's not yet here. Anyway, that's, uh, I, I feel there's a, a limit to what realism can, can speak to. Thank you, yes, I, uh, I, I want, I think I agree. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the vivid sense of hope that Paul, St. Paul in the New Testament conveys. And so on the basis of Paul's uh, and, and John, so in the book of Revelation, again, so thinking about the future, I think you're right. I don't think realism helps us there, but I think there is a certain uh, reality that stems from the hope uh, that Paul and the other biblical writers and thence the tradition places in the resurrection of all of our bodies. Um, but that's not something that can be studied, but it can be something inferred on the basis of what we know to be the reality of, of Jesus and the, and, and, and the reality of what the biblical authors uh, claim or intend in the, in the various texts of the Bible. So I think I'm largely in agreement though. I want to at least make some kind of connection over to the virtue of hope and uh, the, the resurrection of the faithful at the end of time. Well, Paul, thank you uh, so much for the um, introducing this idea of um, critical realism. And I, I remember one author saying that it, it is a way of setting boundaries on the ultimate scope of human knowledge. And, uh, and at the same time, it seems also a way of using um, new metaphors, as you said, or new, and then that's sort of nuancing things a little bit. Um, do you, want to, do you want to speak to that? We have a few minutes here, so let's, we're into the depths of a really good discussion, so let's <laughs> extend it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, um, so one of the slides that I kind of skipped over is the, uh, the fact that over, over the historical, um, especially in the early centuries, the Christian church had uh, great access to a lot of metaphors and even myths. Um, which helped it to articulate uh, the, the meaning of, of, of Christ and, and uh, God's providential electing acts. Um, but, you know, as Augustine, I always tend to go to Augustine, but as Augustine and as many others have pointed out that there's nothing stopping us from being able to reach into other worldviews, including pagan worldviews, uh, or to other realms of knowledge and, and be able to use those in order to speak or refer to the truth of the creation or the truth of, of divine providence. I mean, the, to, to use a metaphor, the one that Augustine uses is to, you know, you, to, to use the, uh, the gold of the Egyptians, you know, and to the gold that the Israelites have taken away uh, from the Egyptians and to use that gold for, for good, nice. right? So even if something that is, is not originally intended for uses that are virtuous or truthful, that on the basis of a confidence uh, in, um, in God's election of, of Israel, of Christ, and, and thence us, we can use those things for, for, uh, for the good or the greater glory of God. So I don't know if I addressed your point exactly, but, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the biblical texts uh, are full of appropriations of, of mm -hmm. A pagan myth. I mean, beginning with Genesis one, obviously. Very good, very good. That's very helpful uh, on on the um, 
some of the things you said about what I, what I like about critical realism is it's it's not stuffy. It's it has <clears throat> there's a creativity to it, and it's a kind of an unfolding uh, approach, which neither falls in the ditch of relativism nor on the other side absolutism. It it seems to find that middle road uh, between between those two, or as you say, historicism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Calvin, did you have a question? You were you uh, Calvin Cabanda? Yeah. Hi, uh, Alan. I, Paul, thank you so much for for your uh, presentation. Uh, just to add to what uh, I think, David it was David who was asked who asked something about uh, whether science and theology you know are they like parallels and or you know do we want to kind of point each point each one of them like push them to opposite on the spectrum i i'm i agree with what he was saying that i think if you go beyond if you get into things like eternity then they start to diverge but as long as you're still within the realm of i think up to the boundary I think science is actually probably a child. It's 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 kind of within the bounds of, of theology, because I think everything that science is normally trying to prove or bring about is is kind of like gonna explain how things in have been created, kind of like what we see around. So, I mean, if we didn't know about the theory of of, of gravity or there's so many other things that haven't been scientifically discovered. It doesn't mean that they don't that it, they don't exist. But theology, you know, and I think a lot of theology should come from kind of like your relationship with, with, with God to kind of get a lot of those answers. You get to understand that a lot of these things were created. But I think even in scripture, it says that God did so many things that if they were written the world wouldn't contain the number of books. So I think I always look at it like with theology, especially if you go in Genesis and kind of a lot of the books, I'm starting to lean towards the fact that we're almost in the middle of a movie. It's kind of like the, the movie starts and there's already so many things that have happened. And, and then, so I, I try to look at science as almost just being a, you know, like a tiny speck and just this enormous, universe of knowledge and, and just I'm almost starting to believe that just some things that God doesn't want to bore us with like well yeah I mean science if you go ahead and discover that these stars exist that maybe every sun has its moon and, and all of that it's like okay but they still exist within the bounds of creation that's how I look at it but you're right Paul once you step outside into things now like eternity then I think they start to diverge so yeah yeah thank you <clears throat> as you're talking it reminds me of a a, a work of uh, several books by a sociologist um out of baylor university <laughs> and i've forgotten i've forgotten his name now um but uh this must be the end of the day but uh in any case the, the point is essentially the the one you're sort of making which is that if it, <laughs> reality is studied by the scientist cannot be separated from Christian truth if it's the case uh, to take the metaphor of laws and lawmaker. If there are irregularities or laws that feature in, as they do, uh, the work of various scientists and scientific disciplines, it makes sense that, uh, it, it makes sense from a kind of an even logical point of view that there would be an author or a lawmaker uh, who is responsible for the laws or the regularities that a scientist is is uh, is studying? Mm -hmm. In any case, um, and I'm sorry I can't recommend the uh, the book of the of the person I'm I'm thinking about because I've forgotten his name. Maybe someone else knows who I'm talking about. But the the work is essentially making a, a kind of a historical argument that parallels your um, suggestion here, which is that. It, it stands to reason that science would emerge from a Christian or a Judeo-Christian environment as it in fact did, I mean, modern science here, that uh, modern science take, is rooted in, uh, first of all, medieval science, 
and medieval science is of course predicated on this whole relationship between laws and lawmaker. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's some important, I mean, that, that historical argument has been overblown, but I think there is uh, a parallel there that is at least very tempting. And I think it's, I, I think it's very suggestive. I mean, Christians are going to want to be curious about the world. We should be curious about the world. Uh, we shouldn't engage in conspiracy theories that counteract um, scientific evidence because this is the world that God created. I highly commend to you the organization BioLogos, uh, which is a, a, an evangelical Christian organization that has many videos, testimonies, uh, articles, and, uh, and other things on its website, biologos.org. Um, and again, similar, picking up on some of the themes that you uh, just highlighted there. I think there are a couple other hands. Uh, Jayant, did you wanna ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much, Paul, for the talk. I just had a quick question. I'm, uh, I was trying to understand. Maybe someone, I think Michael, may have touched on this earlier. But like, do with um, how do you how do you deal with revelation as a way of knowing? I don't know if that's huh. within within this scope. Of yeah. it, but I was just wondering how do you deal with that? <laughs> that's something that you know sometimes can be controversial, even when you're talking to let's say a non-believer. Yeah. Say, oh, you know, you Christians just believe in some you know something that was just said how do we so how do you how can you use that or how do you kind of deal with that right that's a great question so revelation uh i would say as kind of kind of a loose hand uh, sort of a, a loose definition or or what have you has to do i think with inspir uh, an inspiration um the testimony of which is is evident over a, a period a long period of time i don't i don't know if such definitions are are helpful in the, in the end but to, to my way of thinking, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Catholic myself. And so the, 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 the Catholic tradition, along with other church traditions, certainly never speaks of revelation in opposition to reason. So revelation and reason, to use the, uh, the metaphor of at least two or three popes, are like the two hands uh, of, of God that, that um, and it, uh, while the two hands don't map exactly onto two different kinds of divine action, nevertheless, I think that we can say that what is God doing over time? God is creating, right? It's, it's the creation of the world is not a past event. Creation of the world is an ongoing event. Um, and, and again, not to privilege the physicists today, but, you know, physicists are, physicists are very aware of the expansion of the universe that continues from the Big Bang. Um, so that is one kind of action. And, and so our skills of, of reasoning that, that we have as, a, um, as, the, as are bestowed to us by, by God's uh, creation of creatures and our evolution with, the, our, with our large brains, that's the gift of reason. Revelation is not intended to counteract reason or, or counter reason, but rather to uh, supplement reason for our salvation. And so it's creation and salvation. If we take these two as the, the two basic forms or sets of God's uh, action, um, seem to me to map uh, quite well onto reason and revelation. So revelation is that knowledge that we need for our salvation. And as, as I say, it builds upon, but does not, should not contradict what we know by reason in God's creation. 